Hi, everybody. This is Gad Saad. Happy Thanksgiving to all my American friends. In Canada, we celebrate Thanksgiving uh, the second Monday of October, so it's not Thanksgiving for us, but uh, there's never a reason that one shouldn't wake up every day thankful for the good things uh, in their lives. So, again, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, I wanted to weigh in very quickly on an issue that might seem as though it's personal, but it isn't. It's it's. I only use the exemplar because it it speaks to broader important issues, and that is many many people tag me because uh, Sam Harris apparently has uh, closed his uh, Twitter account, and of course, given that many of you know that I took Sam to task with some of his positions, uh, they were tagging me to you know to let me know about the situation. Uh, I should mention that uh, when my f- wife found out that I was going to do a sad truth clip, she said, you know what, it's it's beneath you to even bother uh, weighing in on the matter. Who is he to you? Who cares? What, whatever. Just move on. And and I appreciate that. And I understand her, her concern uh, that I've, I've weighed in enough on the matter. I don't need to uh, say more things. The reason that I weigh in is because there are instructive lessons to take from this. It's not to pile on Sam or that, you know, I'm angry at Sam or that I'm jealous of Sam's book sales. It's unbelievable the the fans, his fans that have been writing stuff that that is unbecoming of a eight year old. You know, one person wrote, uh, "You are upset at Sam because Joe Rogan loves him more than he loves you." This is a grown adult ostensibly I think a man like who would write such things I so I'm only weighing in here because there are some really uh, important things to to recognize and then hopefully uh, I'll never have to weigh in specifically on Sam although I I wish him nothing but the best as I said uh, until you know the trajectory that he's taken over the past few years I had nothing but respect for him I I uh, I was a fan of a lot of his positions and probably still agree with him on m- you know more things than I disagree with him on. We've had dinner together. He's had me on his show. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of qualities that I appreciate in him. But sometimes things change, right? And 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 if you are uh, someone who is driven by a certain deontological ethics, as I am, then there are fatal flaws that someone can exhibit that can regrettably tarnish uh, your opinion of them uh, and and undoubtedly he doesn't care that his opinion is tarnished in, in my eyes but again I share this because we both have a, a a platform from which to discuss these types of issues maybe one day he'll listen to this and think about it some more and uh, maybe have some epistemic humility who knows point number one the seven deadly sins exist as a moral and ethical guideline for you know many many centuries precisely because uh, moral philosophers and theologians recognize the pull of these seven deadly sins now for those of you who don't know at the top of the seven deadly sins is pride the idea being that pride is the root of all of the other sins why because pride in the negative connotation of the term refers to self-love. And as I've explained before, I think, on this show, there are two versions of pride in the French language, which you don't see in the English language. There is orgueil, which is negative pride, and fierté, which is positive pride. So, for example, if you say that I'm proud of my work, that would be a positive manifestation of pride. Whereas orgueil is when you know you're so prideful for example that you never are willing to apologize even when you've done something wrong so the negative version of pride is not something that you know one should exhibit now in the case of uh sam but it's hardly restricted to sam it, you know many people succumb to this he was unwilling to ever listen to anyone who was willing to uh offer him uh you know a not not even devil's advocate i mean to say wait a minute on this position i think 
you might want to reconsider because ABC. He was so driven by his astounding, pathological, obsessive, clinically psychosis of Donald Trump that he lost all sense of measure of rationality. And many of us told him privately and publicly. And you saw it. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people have stopped subscribing to his channel, to his podcast, because, you know, every single thing, if you had a guy who had, who was talking about diabetes, he'd say, yeah, yeah, but diabetes, diabetes is caused by Trump, right? You know, tooth cavities, that's Trump, right? Cancer, who, what causes cancer? We all know it was Trump who caused cancer. There's been no cancer, no cancer since Trump came along. So, and that's why I would then mock it because mockery is a way of using just akin to a surgeon's scalpel that cuts through warm butter, as I always say, satire and mockery and, and you know, uh, humor is used to cut through the BS. And his unhinged hysteria was grotesque. And so I started taking him to task after being quiet for four or five years because I thought it would be inauthentic of me who, you know, supports the deontological pursuit of truth and so on, as I explained in the parasitic mind, to then sit idly when, you know, a, an important voice in the public sphere of ideas is engaging in complete hysteria. So that was one. Then when he completely violated all semblance of deontological ethics, when it comes to the foundational values of what constitutes a civil and free society, presumption of innocence as a deontological uh, uh, principle, uh, the fact that the media should be unbiased in the reporting of facts as a deontological ethical principle of the profession, when he was willing to violate that, when he was willing to say, yeah, yeah, free speech is great, but not for someone as dangerous as Trump. Yeah, yeah, shut him down, shut him down. So every single deontological principle that I would hold dear, that any reasonable person would hold dear, he was willing to violate in the most grotesque of consequentialist bent precisely because of his hatred for Trump. I thought that that was beyond the pale and I called him out on it. Not because I don't like Sam, not because uh, I'm upset that Sam has sold more books than me and I'm not sure how many more books. The parasitic mind has sold a lot, but it's not a, a pissing contest, right? I, I don't take on people based on how many books they've sold. Uh, but I do take on pe uh, people if I disagree with their positions. Now, there was an extra element to Sam, and that is that he was acting like a petulant child. He, you know, unfollowed people. He blocked people precisely because they were, you know, again, uh, challenging him on his positions. That's not what an intellectual does. I get hit by incredible Twitter mobs for all sorts of positions that I take. It only emboldens me. It only makes me dig in harder in my positions. Why? Because I believe in the positions that I take and no amount of blowback is going to alter my my positions. Now, if you if you demonstrate that I'm wrong, then I'm perfectly happy to 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 revise my opinion. But to return to the point of of the issue of pride and how much of what he's doing is, is is due to a form of intellectual narcissism, right? A, a form of dogmatic zealotry, this pomposity. I detest that, right? Part of why I'm affable and jocular and I'm, and I'm fun and I joke around is because I can be very serious professor, but I also don't take myself so seriously. I could be fun. I could be amiable. I could be uh, you know, act like a like a, a silly guy because I'm comfortable in my personhood. I don't modulate in order to create a brand image. I can assure you that Sam is deeply concerned always. I've had conversations with him both publicly and private where should I bring this guy on because it would affect my brand image? Should I not speak to this guy? In other words, he's instrumental, right? He's had people who've written to him to get come on a show, friends of his, that he never answered to, that then write to me and say, hey, how come Sam is not writing to me? Well, because you're now dispendable. I don't like that. I don't respect that. It upsets me because I answer a guy who is, you know, from a village in Pakistan who writes to me because he's a fan. I take time to answer him. 
I spend countless hours doing things that don't advance my pocketbook, that don't give me more fame. Why? Because given the position that I'm in, I just feel compelled that I, you know, I want to do these things. It's part of who I am. So for all sorts of reasons, Sam or the exemplar of Sam started pissing me off. Now, Sam could have easily sent an email and said, hey, come on my show. Let's discuss Trump. Let's discuss your deontological views. Or let me come on your show, God. That's what an intellectual does. What did he do? He now uh, got out of Twitter. I'm not trying to pile on Sam. Don't care specifically about Sam. But I care about living a virtuous life. Now, he, he might say, oh, you know, Twitter is too much of a cesspool. It doesn't help my mental health. Well, then modulate what you say or defend your position some other way or uh, you know whatever it is that you wish to do that's fine but when you block people and I don't mean blocking me I mean when you when you go la 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 I don't want to hear it that's not what an intellectual does I'll tell you a quick story which I mentioned in the parasitic mind there's a family member of mine I'm going to, I'm going to repeat the story because it exactly speaks to Sam's situation a family member, uh, a family member of mine, and I were having a conversation, where he turned to me and said, "Ah, you know those ancient Greeks. You know they were, they were uh, so uh, those Christians. You know they were whatever." Uh, I think he was saying they were anti-Semitic. I can't remember exactly the the context. I said, "Oh, but you know those those the ancient Greeks were not uh, Christians." He said, oh, no, but they were, of course. Greeks are Christian. They were Greek. They were Christian. I said, well, as a matter of fact, no, because the way we place the era, B.C., before Christ, B.C., B.C.E., before Common Era, is literally in function as a function of it being before Christ. So when this person realized that it was incontestable that they were wrong, what did they do? They say, oh, thank you. I just learned something. Oh, I'm sorry I was wrong. Thank you for teaching me something. No. What did this person do? He said, right, right. I said that they were not Christians and you said that they were. So imagine what kind of mind fuck that is in terms of this is its dishonesty. He looks at me, this person, and rather than admit that he was wrong in the most profoundly obvious of ways, he he changes what was our original starting positions of the debate as if i'm going to be confused as to which of us took which position that comes from a deep sense of narcissism nothing you're ever going to say will lead me to alter my position which leads me to a next quote that i'm going to read you this is again from this book the parasitic mind it's on page 142 so along with so let me read it here for you along with his two co-authors leon festinger the pioneer of the theory of cognitive dissonance reminded us more than six days ago about the difficulty of getting someone to change his mind why am i saying this because i'm it is in reference to what sam harris has done and his inability to ever even hear the possibility that he might be utterly unhinged about donald trump so let me read you leon festinger a man with a conviction is a hard man to change. Tell him you disagree and he turns away. Remember those words. I disagreed with him. He unfollowed me. I disagreed more forcefully. He blocked me. More people came along that were in his you know, uh, ecosystem. He gets out of Twitter. So let me repeat the quote. A man with a conviction is a hard man to change. Tell him you disagree and he turns away. Show him facts or figures and he questions your sources. Appeal to logic and he fails to see your point. We have all experienced the futility of trying to change a strong conviction, especially if the convinced person has some investment in his belief. We are familiar with the variety of ingenious defenses with which people protect their convictions, managing to keep them unscathed through the most devastating attacks none of the criticisms of sam harris's positions i i did some very sober analyses no mockery no sarcasm no gadisms 
He could have easily said, hey, hmm, that those are some interesting points you raised, God. No, you're a joker, God. That doesn't seem like an intellectual. But man's resourcefulness goes beyond simply protecting a belief. Suppose an individual believes something with his whole heart. Suppose further that he has committed to his disbelief, that he has taken irrevocable actions because of it. Finally, suppose that he is presented with evidence, unequivocal and undeniable evidence that his belief is wrong. What will happen? The individual will frequently emerge not only unshaken, but even more convinced of the truth of his beliefs than ever before. Indeed, he may even show a new fervor about convincing and converting others to his view. Close quote. This is an incredible quote from 60 plus years ago. That's why I had it in the parasitic mind. So what Sam Harris did, again, don't care about Sam. I care about the example that comes out of the lesson of the debacle of Sam Harris and that is that an intellectual always keeps his eyes and ears open to possibly to possible alternative viewpoints his positions on the vaccines uh you know anybody who's not vaccinated no in a free society people have the right to do as they please just like people came attacking me because i got vaccinated i was a moron i was an imbecile i was a fraud what kind of academic are you to take the jab you idiot you have a parasitic mind dr sad right so in a free society people ha should have the afforded the dignity to choose for themselves an important medical decision like this one this wasn't sam's view so he begins with the hysteria of Donald Trump that lasts for five years in the most grotesque of ways. Then it goes into a complete violation of every deontological principle that is dear to any reasonable person who loves freedom. He violates all of them because, you know, Orange Himmler, right? I don't care if there are dead children in the basement. That's a fatal statement. That's a statement that is breathtaking that someone would would state so instead of saying my god you know what in retrospect that was idiotic of me that was wrong of me let me let me re he doubled down because that's what happens to most people because people suffer from deep pride right whereas i've come home and i've spoken in a curt manner to one of my belgian shepherds and after half an hour, I turn back and I go and I apologize profusely to them. My Belgian shepherd probably doesn't care that I spoke to them curtly, but I'm hurt that I acted wrongly towards my beautiful dog. Therefore, I go apologize. I have a successful marriage with my wife, as I, will exp as I explain in my forthcoming book when I talk about choosing the right spouse and how to act in a marriage, where if I do something wrong, I have the humility to go and apologize, as she does. We don't go to bed angry at night. I know of couples where they've each stated they never apologize because I am never wrong. Well, if you come with that attitude, then your marriage will fail because no one is perfect. Everyone makes mistakes. And if you are contrite when you make a mistake, then you'll only rise in the esteem of others. So Sam Harris could have truly use this moment to only elevate his status why because he held a very staunch position about something he really cared about some people that are not exactly morons came to him in all sorts of ways privately publicly with humor without humor with eth with ethical frameworks without in all sorts of way and tried to show him that maybe he needs to modulate his thinking, maybe he needs to revise some of his thinkings, and he doubled down. He disassociated himself from anyone who ever uttered something that was different from his sacred values. How is that different than his attacking the religious mindset? How could you, from this side of your mouth, have made a career out of, you know, you know, uh, uh, critiquing religious fervor, and then from this side of your mouth, he is basically doing exactly that which he has criticized. That's why I was upset with Sam Harris, because I detest hypocrisy, because I am direct and authentic to a fault. I don't modulate. People say, well, why do you waste your time answering someone on Twitter who's got 12 followers? Because I don't modulate with whom I speak as a function of their followers. Sam Harris does. Sam Harris won't speak to you unless you're worthy of his time. 
I don't do that. People approach me 25,000 times a day on the street. I'm friendly. I'm open. I'm very approachable. That's just my nature, right? So I respect that. I, I am drawn to such people. I don't live in the ivory tower. I'm not an elitist. That's why I call myself the professor of the people, right? And so for all of these varied reasons, Sam Harris triggered something in me that I found quite quite objectionable. But again, it's not personal. If so, tomorrow Sam Harris said, hey, let's go out to dinner and let's talk it out, I'd be the first to say, yeah, sure, why not? Let's do it. Let's go have some, let's ha go have a steak and discuss it. But that's not how he views relationships. He's instrumental. I won't share personal stories that I know because the point is not to, to get into all kinds of backdoor gossip. But I can assure you that there are other traits that I truly despise in how Sam has acted. That's why I came out the way that I did. I'll, I'll, I'm going to uh, give you a story of someone that is a nemesis of uh, Sam Harris, and that's Nassim Talib. And Nassim can be someone who is, you know, quite punchy. I mean, a lot more punchy than I am. I, you know, I always have a twinkle in my eye when I'm going after people. I'm joking and so on, but I don't call people charlatan and scammer and fraud and so on. Nassim is a bit more uh, has his own unique style. We may agree to, uh, that we each, you know, that different people have different styles. I may not like some of the ways that he goes after people on a personal level, but let me share with you something about and the reason I'm mentioning Nassim is because I know that Sam and Nassim have had their issues. When there was a time that I had given a talk at Google and it looked like Google might not put my put up my talk, this was around the time of James Damore, uh, because, you know, uh, uh, if you remember, James Damore had you know, let go by, by Google and some people were thinking, oh, because I gave a talk about evolutionary psychology and sex differences, maybe now they would pull my talk and so on. Nassim, who was going to go and speak at uh, Google, wrote to me privately and said, if they don't put, put up your talk, I will reject their invitation to speak there and I will never associate with them again. What did Nassim do there? He engaged in a costly signal. He said that he's willing to take bear a personal cost because he is out of the honor to protect his friend, me. Okay, I will now share the story. When Sam wrote to me once and said, why are you assorting with Nassim Talib? And then he started bad-mouthing him in an email. And I thought that was terribly objectionable. I think it was because I had just mentioned that Nassim was going to come on my show. I thought it was very strange that someone would write to me to badmouth someone else so that, you know, I don't invite them on the show. That left a bad, bad taste in my mouth. So again, maybe because of who I am as a person, maybe because I come from a culture of honor and shame, honor is everything. It's what I carry as my capital. It's what just like I've got green eyes, my honor is everything. And therefore, when I act the way that I do, whether it be vis-a-vis -vis my own personal conduct or vis-a-vis -vis how others treat you know, other people, it's all driven by a, a strict code of conduct and honor. And in my view, regrettably, Sam has violated that code, okay? In many, many different ways, okay? So what I suggest that Stam does, since he is the great meditator that he is, is that he meditates over what has transpired to allow a the light of humility. And by the way, to the idiots who might be listening to this who, who don't understand my for aggrandizing, when I do all that stuff on Twitter, I am joking. I am, I'm being funny. As a matter of fact, I'm being self-deprecating. It's not I'm arrogant. I'm the exact opposite of that. Most people understand it. My haters don't. But again, allow the light of humility to enter your world. You're not all-knowing. You're not on Mount Olympus 
one of the anointed ones looking down on the rest of the people with your progressive lisp okay eat a bit of humble buy recognize that maybe you were a bit unhinged about donald trump appreciate the fact that there are deontological principles that should never be violated even when it is for a political candidate that you don't appreciate no he's not an asteroid hurling towards earth no we don't throw up every tenet of decency and morality and ethics because you know orange himmler appreciate that reflect on it have some humility and you know what impress me by going back on one of your podcasts where you speak with that fake soft voice and say you know what i was wrong and you know what dr sad is one hell of an intellectual who i was honored to one day have on my show be humble man as uh what is it lamar what was his name lamar kendrick be humble cheers everybody